Good morning again. Uh, my name is Jonathan Elkind. I'm a senior research scholar at the Center on Global Energy Policy. Uh, and we now turn from a conversation looking at options for future US energy policy to a more global perspective. So I, uh, I invite people to please come back and take your seats. This is a conversation you will not uh, want to miss. Uh, I'm going to quickly introduce uh, a, a distinguished set of visitors who have come from very far away, each of them, uh, to join us uh, here at the Energy Summit today. Uh, to my immediate left is Dr. Mari Pangestu, uh, professor, professor of International Economics at the University of Indonesia and a senior fellow here at SIPA. She's also a board member of the Indonesia Bureau of Economic Research and a trustee of the Center for Strategic and International Studies Foundation in Jakarta. Uh, she serves on numerous boards, including the Leadership Council of the UN's Sustainable Development Solutions Network, the High Level Commission on Carbon Prices, and many more. She served previously as Indonesia's Minister of Trade from 2004 to 2011, and Minister of Tourism and the Creative Economy from 2011 to 14. Uh, in her role as Minister of Trade, she led international trade negotiations and cooperation for Indonesia. Uh, so we are very glad to have uh, Dr. Mari Pangestu uh, as our first guest. To her left is Dr. Sunita Narain, who is a Delhi-based environmentalist and author. She's currently the Director of uh, Director General, excuse me, of the Center for Science and Environment, and editor of the fortnightly magazine Down to Earth. Uh, in these roles, Dr. Narain plays an active role in policy formulation on issues of environment and development in India and around the globe. She's also a member uh, of the Indian Prime Minister's Council on Climate Change and has been awarded the Padma Shri, the fourth highest civilian honor in India. Among other uh, recognitions in 2016, Time Magazine selected her as one of the most influential people in the world. Uh, to her left, Xavier Chen, who is the Chief Strategy Officer of ENN Group uh, in China, President of the Beijing Energy Club, and Vice Chairman of the Coordination Committee of the International Gas Union. Before joining ENN uh, about a year ago, Dr. Chen served in senior leadership roles in BP China, uh, later in Statoil, which we today know as Equinor, uh, Xavier holds a PhD in energy Eco economics from the University of Grenoble, an MS from the Asian Institute of Technology, and a bachelor's from uh, Zhejiang University. <coughs> Last but not least, uh, to at the far side is Dr. Mauricio Cardenas, an economist and visiting professor here at SIPA uh, this semester. He served from 2012 to 18 as Colombia's Minister of uh, Finance and Public Credit. Uh, in 2015 and 16, Dr. Cardenas uh, was chairman of the boards of governors of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. He also served for about a year as Colombia's Minister of Mines and Energy. He holds a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and a master's from the University of the Andes. So let me remind uh, those of you who may be either in the audience or watching on the live stream, that you can submit questions for this great panel by tweeting us uh, at Columbia U Energy, at Columbia U Energy, or using the hashtag uh, CGEP Summit 2019. Uh, you can also text your questions using the number that is found on the little cards on the table. Uh, for those of you not here in the hall, that is 347 Six two one seven three nine nine. Um, let me start, if I may, uh, with uh, Dr. Pangestu. Um, one of the most uh, dynamic, challenging uh, aspects uh, of energy decision making in uh, many emerging economies, it's been my, my uh, understanding, has been the need to balance different priorities. Um, uh, in the case of uh, uh, Indonesia and many others, there is a lot of interest that is coming uh, these days from a very high profile, very important 
uh, initiative that the Chinese government uh, has, has started, and it's called the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, I wonder if you could comment on Belt and Road and its significance for decision making in energy uh, in Indonesia. Is Indonesia uh, succeeding to engage with Belt and Road in a way that addresses uh, Indonesia's energy priorities? Well, I think <clears throat> uh, Belt and Road Initiative, as we know, is an initiative launched two or three years ago to try to have connectivity between the Belt and Road countries and promoting projects of connectivity in infrastructure, including uh, in energy. Uh, and in the case of Indonesia, uh, as one of, well, actually, uh, it was launched uh, in Indonesia by, by President Xi Jinping in uh, 2013. Uh, so five years onwards, uh, what, what can we say about the Belt and Road uh, Initiative? I think uh, Indonesia uh, has learned a lot from the experience of infrastructure projects with China in the, in the last decade before 2013. The first 10,000 megawatt uh, power generation that we built uh, was mainly built by China. Uh, and all of it was coal, uh, coal-fired power plant. Uh, and we learn a lot, uh, perhaps, lessons from it, and I think the Chinese also probably also learn lessons from it about transparency of the tender, about best practices, about environmental sustainability, about quality, uh, and so on. So I think moving forward, uh, learning from that experience, as uh, we are now uh, in the midst of trying to identify a few projects under the Belt and Road umbrella, uh, Indonesian government and Chinese government actually are sitting together uh, trying to address this. So there's a co committee between uh, our government and NDRC in China to identify uh, how, how can we improve learning from uh, past experience. Uh, so first of all is project readiness. So the, the Chinese, as part of the Belt and Road Initiative in the case of Indonesia, have actually provided feasibility studies funding. Uh, for uh, either if it's a government or uh, also for the projects. And then we, Indonesia, we determine some uh, criteria. Transparency, uh, environment, the highest environmental standards, win-win, uh, meaning that uh, the inputs and the labor used and the capacity used should, ha should also be devel developing knowledge uh, in Indonesia. And that it shouldn't be confined just to the infrastructure project, but uh, to, uh, to having an integrated development, industrial development, so like an economic corridor. So th those are the criteria. So the, on paper, this is what we're trying to do. Uh, we, we have to see whether it's going to be implemented. I'll put a small footnote, maybe a big footnote on that. In the last five years, other than the Belt and Road projects, we are still continuing to get bilateral uh, funding from China to build more power plants. In the 25,000 megawatt coming on, on board uh, right now, uh, we, it, 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 we are getting also Chinese investments. And all of them are coal-fired power plant. So I think there's still a lot of homework for Indonesia to make sure that we can build uh, the, the energy uh, sources that we need, but in a sustainable way. And maybe I can come back to that later, because we, we are uh, in the midst of trying to, to change that. Very good. Let me stick on the, uh, the China-related, Xavier, and, and come to you. Um, uh, you have uh, had a lot of experience, whether it is in your time at the International Energy Agency, your time with Chinese companies, with international companies. Um, tell us, please, how decision-making in China um, is evolving in terms of top priorities. Last year, we saw uh, extremely uh, uh, significant growth uh, in China's natural gas demand, um, policy driven for air pollution reasons for the most part. What, what's uppermost right now in decision makers' uh, priorities in Beijing f for China's own uh, energy policy making? Yeah, thank you, <clears throat> Jonathan. Uh, first of all, let me offer congratulations to Jason and the team here. I remember 10 years ago we discussed uh, the phone establishment of this uh, policy center is the first time I come here. Uh, so really wonderful work. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> China today is the largest energy producer and energy consumer. And it's also the largest oil importer. 
the second largest LNG importer and the largest gas importer. So over the last 10 years, you know, incremental demand of China is uh, bigger than one India, five times UK. Uh, so the government, the people also realize that uh, this cannot continue. So biggest thing that is happening in China is what we call energy transition. There is a significant shift in policy focus from energy security as a core of energy policy to environmental security as a core of energy security. So this shift is very, very significant because if we, in the past, for energy security, China has abundance of coal. We can rely on coal, but the coal has these all side effects, we know. So now more and more on environmental security, that includes local air pollution reduction and also cl global climate change. So this uh, is also to ensure that the energy security is maintained while ensure economic efficiency as well. So this shift is very, very important. And uh, I look into a very, very comprehensive agenda today. If this is going to happen you know, in China today, I think the topic would be not only about the oil markets, not only about the climate change, but it will be more about how do we save energy, how the digitalization can transform the energy industry, and how do we reduce air pollution from our energy activities, and also how do we develop renewable energies without subsidies. <coughs> so these are the big questions mm -hmm. in China that is uh, happening. But also, I think, being the reform side, how do we open up the electricity sector more for competition? And in the oil and gas sector, you have heard that China is going to create a new national pipeline company. So lots of discussions are ongoing in that country. The fundamental thing is that uh, this policy shift from energy security to environmental security, and it's really going to change the landscape, not only for China, but also for the world. Thank you very much. Dr. Narain, I wonder if I might turn to you next. Um, the last several years in India have been ones of uh, rapid economic growth, and also really accelerated changes uh, in terms of the energy economy. National missions looking at energy efficiency, renewable energy deployment, uh, energy access, climate change, a number of other topics. Tomorrow is the start of the election cycle in India. Uh, I don't ask you to look into a crystal ball, but um, what could one expect in the arena of energy policy uh, coming out of the Indian elections? Oh, I wish, Jonathan, I could look at a crystal ball mm -hmm. and tell you exactly what will happen on the 24th of May when we get a new government. But, uh, you know, when it comes to energy policy, things don't change in India. And I think what's changing, will, I mean, things won't change because of new government coming in. What is changing? The energy policy are the imperatives that we are seeing. I mean, there are two or three things that we are beginning to see more clearly, and that's driving the transition in energy. I mean, one is clearly pollution, air pollution. Air pollution, both in our cities, is becoming a public health emergency. It's becoming an issue which people are realizing has impact on their health. Today, um, the the ruling party, as well as the Congress party, have both in their manifestos put in very strong words about their determination to deal with air pollution. And air pollution is about energy. It's about combustion. It's about you know whether you're burning it in your cars, or you're burning it in your power plants, or you're burning it in your industry. It's about the quality of fuel you use. 
So that is definitely driving a massive interest uh, in trying to see how we can clean up energy sources. When we worked on uh, air pollution in the city of Delhi 15 years ago, we went in for CNG, compressed natural gas, because CNG was seen to be the leapfrog solution instead of incrementally cleaning up diesel or petrol. You just use gas to bring down your pollution. Today, gas is seen to be one of that part of the clean fuel option moving ahead. Delhi has also closed down its last remaining coal-based power plant. We've got now new standards for coal uh, thermal power plants, which are rather aggressive. So there is a driver for clean, um, clean air, which is driving the energy transition. The second big driver, which I think governments will maintain, is the issue of energy access. Um, India is a poor country, and as you very correctly said, I mean, if you look at the scale of China and the transition, we're just beginning that. But we're a poor country, and therefore the, the price of energy, the affordability of energy is critical. The government of India has had an excellent program to supply LPG to poor women so that you can actually deal with that worst possible pollution, the exposure level that women have because they use biomass to cook their food. But the big problem is the cost of the refill. People are too poor. You're dealing with a non-monetized energy source versus a monetized energy source. So that whole issue of how do you supply affordable energy to the poorest to deal with livelihood needs is the second part of the, the challenge. The third is, can you actually do this with, uh, with clean energy? And that's why the government of India, and I don't think that will change, has had a lot of interest in renewable energy. And the irony of it is that I heard the governor before this, but the, but the hard truth, and I think that's a reality people in the US must understand. Uh, the fact of the matter is, um, if you look at the um, IEA's latest statistics, then of, in 2018, the total renewable energy capacity added in the world, the US and India had equal contribution. That's pathetic, <laughs> okay? I mean, India is a poor country. We are still investing in what is still a more expensive source of energy because we understand the need to make that transition. So the scale of the transition is enormous. We are beginning to do it, but I think we have a lot more to do to link the issue of clean energy to the needs of the poorest. And that's the big issue which I think the next government in India needs to spend a lot more time looking at. We cannot afford to have the stigma of energy poverty in a country like India. Linking the interests of the, uh, the poor to the clean energy transition. That's right. Uh, very, very important point. Mauricio, if I might turn to you now. Uh, when we first met, uh, you and I both were affiliated with the, the Brookings Institution. Um, you've spent time in your national government at cabinet level. You've spent time uh, in uh, academic pursuits as well. Now, as we look uh, to, from the United States point, to uh, energy decisions that are being made be it in Colombia or across uh, Latin America, it seems like this is a time of very rapid policy changes, policy reorientations uh, in Latin America. I wonder if you could comment please, on some of the, the main trends that you see, both in terms of Colombia itself, but then also perhaps uh, uh, Brazil, uh, Venezuela, Mexico, uh, some of your neighbors, please. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here, part of this panel. And I think I, I'll just build on what has been said before. Um, this is an area, and you mentioned this in the introduction, where we just have to strike balances between conflicting goals and objectives, and I'd say we have three major issues. First, energy access. Um, in Latin America, for example, we still have 19 million people exactly. that are chopping woods to generate energy. Um, in just one country like Haiti, 
It's about 6.7 million people. Only 38% of the population has access to energy. But not just the very poor countries, even middle income, high middle income countries like Mexico has 1.7 million people without access to energy. Colombia, 1.5. So energy access, access is a big issue. But at the same time, we have the problem of climate change. And climate change has been particularly severe in terms of its consequences for the countries in the Caribbean. My own country, Colombia, facing um, um, heavy rainfalls one season, droughts the next season. So climate change is a major issue. We have to reduce emissions. And then we have another very important element here, which is that many of these countries are rich in fossil fuels, oil and coal, and a lot of people generate their income through fossil fuels. So how do you square this circle? Um, I think first, on our side, the more research we do and the more we understand these issues, the less tensions there'll be between these goals. And so we'll ease uh, uh, the, the decisions that have to be made. But at one point or another, there'll have to be their, their trade-offs, and you have to establish priorities. And I'd say it's priority number one is energy access. Mm. I mean, we cannot talk about uh, development, um, reduction of poverty, without really bringing access. So that's, I think, priority number one. Now, I think that's an area also of a tremendous business opportunity, because many people that do not have access to energy is because they are not in the cities, they're in isolated rural areas, so we need mini grids, we need um, very small scale solar panels that are efficient, um, and that is in itself an interesting commercial opportunity. Um, and then I'd say um, on, on climate change and, and reduction of emissions, um, three of our countries, Mexico, Chile, and Colombia, I was finance minister when we introduced the carbon tax in Colombia, um, uh, have done that and, uh, and reducing uh, the use of fossil fuels and generating changes in uh, the, the more efficiency in the use of energy, uh, bringing in uh, more uh, electric vehicles, uh, also making sure that we use more natural gas in terms of transportation. All those things are very important to reduce uh, carbon emissions. And finally, I'd say, and this is, I guess, the, the elephant in the room, is what to do about uh, fossil fuels. These are, you know, energy uh, rich countries. And I'll just uh, mention one case where this is too apparent and too evident, which is Venezuela. Uh, Venezuela used to produce nearly 2.5 million barrels of oil per day. It's now down to, some people say, 800,000. There's news today in the New York Times that it's even below 800,000. Well, the first thing they have to do when there's a change in government, hopefully soon, it's to increase oil production, because that's really the main economic opportunity for, for Venezuela. Um, so really, um, in some countries, um, uh, I think priority number one is getting the, the economy back on track, and in the case of Venezuela, it means uh, producing more oil. But uh, I guess we can talk more about other countries. You mentioned Brazil, Mexico. We can talk that in the second round. Okay. I want to pick up on that last point of the, 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 the role of fossil fuels going forward, because although um, this panel focuses on a number of very important uh, emerging economies, uh, this issue is one that unites also policymaking and, and fateful choices going forward for the United States as well. So there's this idea of a just transition um, for coal miners in China or railroad workers in India whose livelihood depends on moving coal substantially, or for the, uh, the, the, the coal industry as well uh, in Indonesia. How are your countries thinking about the challenge of this, the, the future of fossil fuels. Obviously, um, as you have each, each emphasized, the development uh, imperative must come first, mm -hmm. but there is then over the horizon this question of what does, how does one provide opportunity, uh, uh, employment, et cetera, for a, an industry that might be going through a rather pronounced transition. Dr. Pangesu, do you want to start us off? Uh, yes, I think Indonesia produces oil and coal. 
Okay, uh, we are increasingly uh, less of a producer of uh, oil, uh, but we are still a large producer of coal. And from the perspective of uh, the electricity generation and the, lo the cost of energy, coal is still the, the lowest cost. So uh, I think we are in this uh, crossroad at the moment where we, we know that we do need to increase energy access uh, to have development. But uh, for us, the lowest cost is still coal. Fuel will increasingly, uh, because we are uh, increasingly becoming a fuel importer, will become less. We also have natural gas. So at the moment, uh, those are kind of the two that are uh, high up in, in the energy access. But we also know the, the cost to climate change and health costs. So uh, one of the things that you didn't mention uh, that I'm on the board of, I'm on the board of, uh, I'm a commissioner on the Low Carbon Development Initiative, which is part of the new climate economy, which tries to argue that you can develop, but at the same time, uh, if you use uh, clean energy systems, go to renewable, you can achieve both. Okay, so we've done, there's been a lot of exercise being done on this. And it actually shows you, if you uh, look at the cost of coal now, yes, it's the lowest cost. But the moment you calculate the, the cost to pollution, the health costs, the CO2 emission, it's almost double the cost. And it's higher than the cost of uh, natural gas or even uh, solar and wind, even with the inefficient uh, cost of Indonesia we are about double the international price of sol uh, solar and wind uh, at the moment because we haven't deployed it in a large scale as has been done in India and China. And the reason why uh, this has been happening is because of the big disincentive, or rather the, the incentive that is uh, pushing us towards coal. And this is what needs to be changed uh, in the, if we want to have more renewable energy. So the scenario where you can have higher growth and uh, lower CO2 emission meeting your climate change, uh, it rests on the case that you must shift from uh, fo a fossil fuel to renewable energy mainly. Coal probably still remains more or less, it's 25% uh, now and it will be about 25% uh, in, in the future too. So I think the challenge is one, coal, yes, I don't think we can get rid of coal totally, but fossil fuel, it will be uh, reduced. We, we will be removing the fuel subsidy after elections, I hope. We have our elections on April 17th. Uh, we haven't been able to remove the fuel subsidy in the last one year. Uh, and, but coal is still having a lot of subsidy. Uh, and we also have the problem of the state-owned monopoly of the, of the electricity company. Uh, there's not enough uh, sufficient incentive for renewable energy. Uh, so I think this is, this is the big challenge for Indonesia. We need to shift from coal uh, towards uh, more renewable energy. And in the case of Indonesia, it may be hydro, it may be geothermal, uh, as well as solar and wind. And, and you ask the question, what does this mean for job opportunities? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that the coal industry is one of, probably one of the biggest challenges for us mm -hmm. to address, right? Mm -hmm. So they need, I think they need to wake up that you are in a perhaps a sunset industry. We are already facing reduced exports to India and, and China because mm -hmm. India and China are, are shifting, right? So the two solutions. One is to go into clean coal energy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. to, to that extent, they have to shift. And maybe they have to also shift to renewable because renewables actually, I think some of the previous speakers mentioned, is actually new potential, new industry new growth potential. Mm -hmm. You can take solar cells as an example. Uh, Vietnam, since they shifted to uh, using solar uh, energy, China also, have a big, huge industry, solar cell right. industry, right? right? So these are, uh, they're in, in renewable energy, there's a whole uh, potential that is out there. So the final thing I would say is that there's a lot of challenge for Indonesia because we are not like China or India, which is large land-based. We are 17,000 islands. So there's no one solution fits all. We need to really be very, very creative in and having the right incentive and the right government policy because it's gonna be a different solution in different parts uh, of Indonesia. But a lot of it can be uh, renewable energy based. We, right. we do have the resources for that. Xavier, if I could come to you next. I, I mean, looking at this question about the transition away from coal and what does it mean for uh, workers in that industry? What does it mean for communities uh, that are 
concentrated areas of, of coal extraction uh, and, and conversion, uh, noting obviously the, the difference in the political and economic uh, systems between the China and the United States and, and other countries. How are people thinking about this challenge in China? Coal played a very, very important role in China's energy uh, economy. Uh, we thanked coal. Uh, coal provides uh, universal access of electricity. China is the only developing country that meets UN millennium goal of uh, electrifying all villages by 2015. So, but now it's a trans transition, energy transition in China is to reduce cost share in energy mix. From about 10 years ago, 70% to today, 60%. So 10 years, 10 percentage points in the largest energy markets. That's phenomenal. Second is to expand gas. To, you know, when I was working in the IEA, we published a report called Developing China's Natural Gas Market, the Energy Policy Challenges, published in 2002. That time, gas in energy mix only 3%. Last year, 7.8%. And the goal is to double the share to 15% by 2030. Yeah. And then third element is really to expand the non-fossil fuels in energy mix from today's around 12% to 20% 20 by 2030. And then there is a more ambitious goal to reach 50% by 2050. So coal, the law is more reserved today in large scale power plants. There is enough room for Coal to continue to burn in large scale, high efficient coal fired power plants. And China has built the largest and most sophisticated coal fired power plants equipment generation facilities. And then replace all the dispersed coal burning in villages, in residents, in factories by natural gas or by electricity in terms of heat pump and other technologies. So to your question about workers in coal mining provinces, villages, cities, you have noticed that the, over the last 10 years, very strong government intervention to close down the small scale, dangerous coal mining. Because there are lots of accidents, either compulsory closed down or forced merger by big companies so that they can improve safety conditions. And China is not the only country that experiences. UK did the same you know, in the early 70s, you know, when they tried to close coal mines and the workers protest. But uh, Madame Thatcher, as Iron Lady, very strong. So good news is that uh, today, the coal miners, the young people do not want to dig coal anymore. Old people, they continue to dig for a few years and then we will retire. So there is a social program at the provincial level that uh, keeps the old existing coal mines operation to meet electricity demand in large scale power generation. At the same time, really to phase out the core you know, in the energy mix. Not completely, but they will be reserved for large scale power generation and more for feedstock in uh, core based petrochemicals. Great. Um Dr. Narain, do you want to come in on this a question of the, the, the just transition and what happens to the coal miners, the coal communities, et cetera? It's a very complicated question, it seems to me, maybe especially in India. No, it's complicated everywhere in the world. But I think the big issue for India is really, I mean, those are livelihood issues, but uh, we also have state-owned companies. For me, 
Uh, the biggest issue really is about energy access because coal is, like you said, in China, as well as India, it is still the cheapest form of energy. And that is in spite of the fact that we have done a lot. And I think that's where our governments are trying very hard to find a transition by shaking up the coal sector. I mean, you've had now in India, you have a cess on coal. Mm -hmm. So you have a cess on every ton of coal that is mined in India. You have major a policies. Yes. Mm. A cess, a, a surcharge. A surcharge, sorry, yes. a surcharge on um, coal. It's like a tax on mm -hmm. the coal that is being mined. You also have increasing pressure because a lot of the coal mines are in forested areas of India. So there is a lot of pressure not to open up new coal mines because of the, uh, because of the pressure that they would uh, destroy the forests. You have um, a cess or a tax now um, uh, that every coal um, mine has to pay to the people who are affected by the mining areas. So um, essentially, they have to pay the poor people whose homes were this. So it's like a benefit sharing arrangement, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is putting additional costs on coal. Mm -hmm. Over and above that, we are talking about, we've got the new standards on coal-based power plants so that you can reduce the emissions and those standards I've been delayed the implementation of the standards, but we will get there. We will get there in the next two years, which would mean higher costs on coal generation. We are trying to get a change in the merit order dispatch so that you can actually, if a, if a coal plant is not clean, has not met the standards, it will go below on its ability to be able to supply the energy. Mm -hmm. So okay. using an incentive, disincentive to be able to push for it. So there's a lot of effort now to reduce, uh, to either make coal clean or to reduce it in the energy mix. But right. the dilemma is, the fact is that you have very massive numbers of people whose needs are still not served for energy. And as yet, and let's be absolutely clear about this, because I hear a lot of this very romantic stuff about, you know, India should do it even if the US is not doing it. And, you know, we <laughs> don't make the same problems that we have done and all the rest of it. I hear all this very sort of banal stuff coming in all the time. But the fact is, let's be very clear, there's a huge cost to the transition to move to towards renewable energy and to cleaner sources of energy, and particularly when affordability and the issue of very poor people is at stake. And they are the victims of climate change today, so let nobody here preach to us to tell us, oh, you know, climate change is going to happen and we need to do something about it. We know the pain of climate change. It's happening in our nations. It's affecting the poorest of the world who have not contributed to the emissions that are in the atmosphere. So let's understand the immorality of climate change that is happening today. And let's understand the need, therefore, to talk more strongly, more pragmatic. I hate the word pragmatic, actually. Uh, to talk much more real about how this transition will happen particularly in countries where the energy needs are immense and they will have to use more fossil fuels in the years to come unless we can do something drastic. That's the conversation we need a serious discussion on. And the last point I want to make here, Jonathan, is that I am in favor of gas only because of the fact that it cleans up local air in our part of the world. So we push for clean gas as natural gas. But the fact is, all the transition that is being made in other parts of the world, including the US, from coal is to gas. And gas is still fossil energy. It has high methane emissions, which are not being accounted for. So let's get some more real sort of conversation in here when we talk about the end of coal. What are we jumping towards? All right, thank you very much. Those are I, exceptionally important points. Um, I, I want to I pick up on one particular point that, that you made, which um, speaks to the need for investment for capital flows in order to enable yeah. uh, the kind of energy transition that we're mm -hmm. talking about. And Mauricio, here I, wanna, I want to uh, exploit, if I might, um, your uh, past experience working with some of the big international financial institutions, the bank and, and the International Monetary Fund, 
What role should there be, what is there in today's world for the big multilateral development banks? Or is that the wrong model for helping to mobilize uh, investment that is needed in emerging economies uh, for the clean energy transition? Well, it's certainly one component of it, but not, not the whole of it. Uh, I mean, the multilaterals can play a role, uh, especially when it comes to um, the public sector, um, public investment, and this is, this is certainly an issue in terms of energy access. Um, but the majority of the solutions here come through the private sector. So I think it is essentially a conversation about other source and forms of, uh, of financing. And by the way, let me make a parenthetical remark about the multilaterals connecting with this discussion of uh, coal-based uh, uh, power generation. The, the, it's, it's now virtually impossible to get financing from a multilateral to do anything related to coal. And so that means that the bulk of the solution in terms of how to handle these social issues with the coal producers uh, using the coal reserves that many of these countries have <coughs> depends entirely on domestic financing. It's, it's almost impossible to get international financing for coal-based projects. Now, on, on more private investment, I think that helps also me touch the issue of Mexico, because Mexico is an interesting case of a country where there's a lot of private investment, or there was a lot of private investment flowing into building the gas pipelines to connect with the U.S. for natural gas, or the new round of uh, oil um, uh, uh, bids uh, when the energy market was open, and all of that is now uh, coming to a halt. At least people are in the wait and see mood to see what happens with uh, President Lopez Obrador. I think here the jury's still out. A lot of people are pessimistic about Mexico. I think um, I wouldn't give up on Mexico yet. Um, I think I, I, you mentioned that you don't like the word pragmatism, but I think mm -hmm. pragmatism will prevail in Mexico, and um, and I certainly hope that it's more private investment helping develop the energy sector. Uh, in the future, and um, my sense is that after some noise and debate and populism, um, these uh, pragmatism will be basically um, uh, back, uh, will put Mexico back uh, on track in these developments. So, Xavier, I saw you wanted to come in on this. Let me uh, just plant the seed in each of your uh, thinking that I'll do a last round to the four panelists. and. I'd like you to think about the, uh, what, what the kind of one-line message is that you would want to have uh, an American audience, as this is predominantly, um, take away about the energy choices that are in front of your country going forward in terms of energy security, the transition, et cetera. But Xavier, please come in on the, the, the finance issue. Uh, not on finance issue, but I really want to pick up uh, Governor Isley's uh, point. Uh, he want to. I applaud the Washington State and Governor's leadership in any transition in climate change. And he said that uh, we need to engage China. I would say China is already largely engaged. This panel gathered the three most uh, largest uh, Asian developing countries. I can say from a Chinese perspective that uh, you know, we are worried lack of American leadership in energy transition from what we hear from the media. So we really hope that uh, the United States and China, India, Indonesia can work together to accelerate the energy transition. You know, the Chinese uh, used to use the word uh, reform or change, but uh, recently President Xi Jinping feels that uh, these, two, these words are too weak. So he adopted the much stronger words, revolution, mm -hmm. the energy revolution. So we need uh, to work together you know, to foster energy revolution together with America. So that's the message okay. I want to Very leave good. to the American audience. Thank you. Parting shots, please, uh, Mario Pangestu. Yes, I would like to call for you know, countries like Indonesia need to make the energy transition, and we want to do it before we can't stop breathing, right? So we need to do it now, and we need to have the uh, all the help from, not from the US, but I would also call on China, uh, including uh, in all the Belt and Road initiatives uh, that we are pursuing together. Very good. 
Dr. Just, Narain. I'll just echo what Xavier said that we are going to get there. We will. We have the development imperative. We need energy security. We need environmental um, sustainability. That's our imperative. But I think what we are in together is that this is our joint imperative. We all need to get there, and we need to see more leadership in the U.S. Very good. Uh, Mauricio, please. Agree. I think uh, this is not about <laughs> preaching. This is about doing. Yeah. And, um, and I think we're convinced uh, that we need to diversify our energy metrics, that we need to develop the renewable sector, that we have to provide access, because it's in our own benefit. Um, and, um, and I think this is really what's driving countries that are at the lower level of income than the United States, but taking more decisive and bold actions which is paradoxical. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking this outstanding panel.